Welcome to Office Hours. If you are tuning in on YouTube, welcome. And if you want to learn more about what we do here, you want to head over to officehours.global. And our first hour is typically answering your questions on media and virtual events. Our second hour is something that we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we're going to talk about content planning, all of the content, your website, your blogs, as you're getting ready for the end of the year planning is going to be imperative to your success. So go ahead and enter your questions in. If you're in Mukana, answer, enter your questions for us to get this party started and to learn more about the rest of the week and the shows that we have planned, head over to officehours.global. All right, Bill, take it away. Thank you, Liberty. Our first question comes from Guy Cochran in Seattle, and he's wondering what are the basics of API? I believe that's Applications Programming Interface. And how do you use it? All right, Jonas? So an API generally describes how you can communicate with a program and trigger something in that program or give it certain data or get certain data. There are multiple ways of using that. You can have an OSC API, a TCP API, an HTTP API. One of the more, more common ones is uh, one called REST, which describes how to um, access specific resources. And if I cut to this, this is something called Postman. It's a test client that a lot of us developers use to test APIs. So we can apply if all the API calls here on the left. I can say I want to list past webinar instances over the API from Zoom. And I'm not authenticated, so it says I don't have a token. But it's even easier than that to use an API. If you use Companion, you already use an I. Someone else implemented it for you. And then there's also the option, a lot of APIs have a public API where you don't need to log in, like a QLab or other software. And then you can just use that to talk to the specific program from Companion. And I'm more than happy to do a, a after hours lab talking about how to get to the most typical APIs. That'd be wonderful. Thank you, Jonas. John? Not fair that uh, Jonas got dual core brains and the rest of us only have single core brains. I don't know how that worked, but I was trying to remember the before times when we didn't have APIs and we used to do direct connections into the database with lots of security problems in that regard. But it's uh, just a method on how to, to query data and get data back. But Jonas did a good job explaining and articulating. Good job, Jonas. And Peter. Well, going back far enough, uh... Nigel, I'm going to just think about it from the standpoint of, uh, you know, we had function calls back in the 70s, and they were standard function calls. And if you decide to go outside of those, all bets were off. And they just evolved into becoming application programming interfaces. All right, next question. Next one comes to us again from Guy Cochran in Seattle. This time he says, if you were to go spelunking in your garage or storage area, what interesting artifacts might you uncover? Nigel, let's hear what you'll find. So actually, we just completely uh, done this. And we lived in a 4,000 square foot house. And we're now living in a small apartment. And we've had a storage space full of stuff that we've been ignoring for a couple of years. So we finally cleared out the storage space. And I'll tell you, I found a table that my slide projector used to stand on, you know, with the legs that extended, uh, which is actually quite useful. And all the VHS cassettes from stuff I used to do in the UK, but not the player to play them. Oh, no. Maybe someone else on the panel has that. Courtney? Well, I went spelunking fairly recently in mine, and uh, this is one of the things I found. I... Uh, <laughs> The action, and I booted it up and it actually still runs, which is one of the original teleprompters, CompuPrompt from 1987, uh, with the uh, monitor there that has the image reversed on it, the old big old CRT, and that would mount on the camera. And it all ran on that Atari 800 uh, with a little Sony monitor there. Boot it up and it still runs this some 38, 40 years later. That is a gem of a find. John? I was typing my question in for Courtney. Um, guy, you need to come to my garage. I've got some really interesting spelunking in my garage. I have the original AT&T phone that were direct connections. It says AT&T, it's super old. 
And uh, I have an old beer can collection. I have the first Budweiser can that was ever made. It was from the 40s. It's really interesting. I got all kinds of kind of treasures in there still. Alex? I was just spelunking over the weekend looking for a couple of things. A couple of things that I ran across. Um, I've got a lot of 360 cameras, <laughs> like, like little ones, little ones and big ones and all kinds of other things that I, I noticed that I just kept on opening up boxes like, oh, there's another one, a Kodak one that I don't, I don't remember. I think I used it like four times. And uh, and so I've, I've got a couple of those. I've got a lot of hard drives sitting there, like little portable hard drives. Um, I found a, a, an ET hand that lights up. <laughs> we used it for an event. We had actually a model maker make it. And so it literally is a very realistic uh, hand from ET. And I have both the film version and the DVD version because we first built the film version and realized, oh no, we have to have the DVD. And, and in case you're wondering, they're different hands. So anyway, so um, so I found I found those over the weekend. It was kind of humorous. Nice. And Mitchell? Yeah, other than almost falling and killing myself, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a bunch of ADB dongles for various pieces of software that I either have or do not have anymore. Um, ADB, of course, being the old Apple interconnect serial system. Um, some ISDN uh, modems. I've got like three or four of those, a Prima, a Zephyr, um, and um, a bunch of NVIDIA cards, which no longer will work on my Mac. All right. And Peter? Well, for the motorheads in the group, I uh, actually, it was just Saturday. I found cleaning out the garage and I found a leftover from my son's days as a true motorhead, a Holley four barrel carburetor suitable for a Ford uh, 5.0 engine. engine. Oh, and I'll add to to that. I found I found some phones like really old, like the little Nokia's like this, the big Nokia with the flip that looked like a, a a big brick. So I guess I've always been into like mobile devices before it really became a thing. So that and some old um, JavaScript books that are like yay thick. So to all those who are in school right now, you are very lucky that you can scroll and don't have to flip through books. All right, let's go to the next question. Seven Scroll in Brooklyn says, morning guys for production using an iPhone 13 Pro. We're undecided between the DJI Osmo 5 or the small rig video cage setup to get steady shots, etc. What would you rather? Pros and cons? Thanks. Jason? I, it really depends on on the kind of production that you're doing. The two have very different use cases. So if you want a cage, if you want to attach a lot of things to the iPhone, um, you want, you know, if you've got really steady hands and you've got a, you know, a big wooden handle, yeah, you can almost certainly get close, but, you know, nothing is going to beat an actual gimbal. The gimbal, of course, is, is just the opposite. You attach nothing to your phone. You attach your phone to your gimbal, and you use the gimbal to, um, in turn, completely stabilize the shot. So it just depends on your use case. Noah? For the gimbal, you'll have to balance it, right? And so I've had the Osmo, the older version, I think it was the 3, where my phone was actually too big for that gimbal. So that's something you might want to look at as I had to add a counterbalance um, to make that work. You also introduce another battery that could die. Um, but generally, the gimbal will give you smoother shots compared to the handheld, whereas the handheld rig with the small um, ready rig, excuse me, or, or um, that rig will, will allow you to move faster and more fluid. So that's what we used for the shows that we just covered. Um, another bonus about the gimbal, though, is you have something to set it down on with those little mini legs. Good call. Jason? Oh, sorry, Jonas? Yeah, so I would always look at what is the end product that you want. They do produce a good product and they both are ways to stabilize. One of them works by making your phone a little more heavier. So you actually have to use your muscles a little more. And the other one makes it totally stable. And if you then, the gimbal is great if you then actually move. But if you just stand there with a gimbal, you might as well use a tripod instead of the gimbal if you can. And I would go from, do you more want like a hand held shot or do you want a smooth sweeping shot with the gimbal and then train that. Great points, Jonas. Bill? I actually own both and I actually use both in different circumstances. And it depends on what I'm trying to get done. Uh, I actually have a small uh, quick release on the bottom of my DJI. I have an Osmo 4, but it's functionally just a version before the 5. And so if I need... Uh, 
super smooth and I'm going to be moving a lot, I tend to run that rig. But the cage around the phone remains on the phone all the time as well. So I actually have the small rig cage on top of the DJI and... Um, it just depends on how you want to rig things. You have to be concerned with weight if whatever uh, gimbal device you have is sensitive to that. So sometimes I do have to take the phone out and use it magnetically on the on the gimbal. But um, just two different tools, both of which work great. Oh, I will say that also the iPhone, uh, your level of iPhone, the 13 and I think the 12 before it, had pretty good optical image stabilization, even just built in. So you can get smooth shots with either on something. And just bringing in the chat for a moment, Mickey, so 7th Girl has said that it's for a cooking stream. And so Mickey just chimed in saying very different looks and feels. You need to know what you're going for, which has been said a number of times. So if it's that, you know, that action type of shot and moving around, sure, the gimbal will probably work really well for that. And then that steady shot, um, the tripod, as been said before. Next question. Roy Myers in Bel Air, Maryland comes up next, and Roy says, I located how to create keynote slides with Apple Script, but can't find anything about changing text on existing slides. What's a good reference for Apple, scripts and, uh, Apple Script and learning what it's capable of doing? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, there is a um, <clears throat> iWork Automation or iWork Automate. Uh, it's with Sal Segoyan, and uh, it, it, has, it's, it hasn't been updated for a little while, but it does have a lot of places to look at, at how you can automate iWork. And if you put it in the second hour of suggestions, I, I can probably get Sal to come uh, join us and do a Q&A with you about it specifically. So, um, but but first take a look at iWork Automation or do a search for Sal Segoyan Automation and you'll see a bunch of websites that are available there. Um, but uh, um, I, I think you might have Mac OS Automation as well. Um, and so he is really the the holder. <laughs> he, was at, he was at Apple for a long time, uh, kind of, managing this and so he's now on his own does a lot of work with automate a lot of the companies that still use apple script for automation and uh, and he's a really good resource so look for him and then also uh, we'll we'll get him on just put him in a second hour suggestion we'll we'll get him on the show all right next question Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here on the panel. I have a single choice of ISP Comcast, currently a residential plan. If a business line was added, how redundant can I expect that service to be versus what I currently have? Thoughts on terrestrial cellular options? Call reception can be spotty for handsets here. John? So I'm in the middle of adding redundancy when redundancy in my house. And so if, if WeLink's not going to come to your area, but here's what you do. You find a friend that's in line sight, you get ubiquity radios, he's on a different WAN provider, and then you cross connect each other's WAN device back to your house. That's the answer. Jason? Um, if one goes down, the other will go down. There's nothing special about Comcast business other than there's a service level agreement, um, which, you know, if you actually read into is a terrible service level agreement. I think everyone could agree on that. Um, suffice it to say, yeah. I'm going to go with John. And Mitchell? I have the business class, uh, 300 down, 30 up. Um, they claim that there are some little uh, uh, tweaks to it to make it better than the residential version. I don't think so. In fact, uh, I have a neighbor that has a residential version that beats my business account at a fraction of the price. Do you know why? Are they closer to the tower or anything? Um, I think it's just a matter of which server they have you up on and what kind of DNS uh, server you're looking at. Okay. And Courtney? Yeah, they just change your router and uh, open, it, open it up a little bit uh, <laughs> to a higher bandwidth. But if you're using the same, if, you're, if your uh, internet is coming in over your cable TV line, uh, it's a copper line, uh, it's not going to be redundant and it's not going to be any that much faster than you can probably get uh, with a regular service other than they'll speed up your up, uplink speeds. The only difference would be is if they're offering to run fiber to your home for the business class, then it would be redundant and then it would be uh, much faster. But if they, they'd have to run a separate fiber rather than coming in over your regular copper cable line. And go ahead, Peter. I was going to say from a redundancy for Comcast and frankly, even for UVerse, the, I mean, I have a single fiber coming to the home and once it gets to the central office, uh, there's no guarantee that they'll switch it over at any time fast. And certainly backhoe fade will destroy any redundancy on fiber or, or cable in my case. And Nigel. 
Well, I didn't know I'd take my hand, so my only advice there would be to move. <laughs> <laughs> they, thank you, Nigel. Only if, only if. And Tim McCullough says, I'd suggest a cellular backup since he was asking about redundancy. So let us know what you decide, Josh. Next question. Now, a Sergeant Fullerton right back with, has anyone used the Sennheiser EWD lineup? EWDX was recently announced at Infocom and is capable of up to one, uh, 293 channels in high density mode. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I, have, I haven't used this. Uh, it does look interesting. I, I will say that uh, I, I just kind of ignore high density mode because the generally the um, the quality of the audio is noticeably lower <laughs> in high density mode. So it would work like in a pinch. It would work, and where that where you see people use high density is when they're doing. Um, I don't know. For some reason, I have a I have a picture over myself. <laughs> anyway, so um, uh, the. Um, uh, the high density mode generally is going to is going to lower the bandwidth of all of these and so this is a i believe it some kind of it's not just an rf it's data like much like you would see with the, the sure um microflexes but i think it's a different it's a different system but it's similar to those so it's going to reduce that data um to to spread it out and the high density mode is really used in multiple sessions so you have a you have a location and you've got like eight sessions going on and you want a bunch of different mics or, or a large event going on and you start to increase that density. But I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I've definitely noticed the difference when we've jumped to high density with the, at least the microflexes enough so that I wouldn't use it again. Okay. Go ahead, Noah. Yeah, that's super interesting. I, I wasn't necessarily expecting to use that many channels or even right. high density mode, but yeah. um, it does also say 146 um, in regular mode. So yeah, I, I was just super great. impressed by the yeah what it what it's saying it could offer. So we'll see. You know, it's I still mean, not out until January. But the main thing that I that I always try to figure out is what platform is it using and what other platforms use the same thing so you know rarely are, does someone have their own frequencies you know so there's something else what else it lives in that ecosystem and a good example is the microflex so the sure microflex shares the same platform as the free speaks so if you do an event with lots of free speaks and lots of uh, microflexes you have a problem <laughs> you, have, like, you have a density problem so so um or if by some chance a hotel has a, another event going on next to you that might be using free speaks um at the same time. Not that that's ever happened to me, that we've had issues. Next question. Next one comes to us from Darren Sorello in Dallas, Texas. He says, when I take photos on my iPhone, two versions are saved, an HDR and a non-HDR version. Can you briefly explain the difference and which version should I be keeping as to avoid duplicates? Go ahead, Alex. Well, I'll argue they're not duplicates and I don't think you want to get rid of either one of those. Um, so what happens is when it's in HDR mode, the phone takes, I believe, my understanding of this is it takes multiple images very, very quickly together, um, and then it and then it merges them. That's the old. This is the whole the the original way we did it, HDRs, is that we would um, basically take multiple exposures and then build something that 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 can show greater highlights and and dark and darker darks. You know, a, a higher dynamic range, um, and that's why we call it high dynamic range. And so the um, I believe that the the SDR, the basic one is just that center shot. The one it thinks it was exposed correctly, um, but it'll be blown out or it won't have some of the dynamic range that was there. Um, the HDR version of that will be, um, uh, will have more, generally more range to it, or it'll be tone mapped into something that is capturing things like highlights in the sky. Um, if I was gonna pick one, I'd pick the HDR one if I, was, if I had to, uh, but you know, images aren't that big. I would, if you're gonna capture them, you can turn HDR mode off if you don't really want that. But otherwise, if you're turning HDR mode on, I would keep both images that are generated. And Chad adds to that bracketing for those who are familiar that's what with That's thing. what the HDR mode does. So HDR okay. mode brackets. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Next one comes from Noah Sargent again in Fullerton. I started a new project that involves a former minor league baseball stadium and the Dactronics Display Studio. No instructions were left, and I'm still figuring out the routing for their old system. Any tips? Go ahead, Alex. Portable monitors. <laughs> you know, like that's the big thing. It is, uh, you know, if if you can't find the, I mean, obviously there, if you, you so you can't find the manual anywhere online. You can't. I haven't really looked thoroughly through stuff okay. and I only spent, it was my first day last week. So I spent maybe an hour like playing around. I was like, yeah, I'm going to have to pull stuff apart to like really see what's where. And there's like yeah. servers and routers. And so like, I was just, Depending I, I on haven't the budget. used that. Sorry. 
depending on the budget, you know, the thing that you want to do is back up and uh, draw a wiring diagram of the whole thing. If they don't have one, you're going to have to build one to know. And I wouldn't touch anything until I did it. You know, like, and just really just try to identify where all this stuff is going. And if you don't know where it's going, if it hasn't been marked or something's on the other end, that's what I was talking about with portable monitors, like little handheld monitors. We used to use a PIX240 for this a lot because it was just, it just kind of saw everything. But something that's battery operated that has SDI and HDMI in, um, assuming that everything's H HDMI or SDI and not DVI or, or some other, you know, crazy format. So that might be the other thing that you have to do. But you need some small monitor that's battery operated that you can walk around and go, okay, I'm going to walk over here. And even if things are in a big server room, it's just so much easier to have a battery operated. I'm going to pull this output in. I'm going to push it into here and just see what comes out the other end. Um, you know, and so, and then, you know, the, I know this is an obvious thing for you, but for, for those listening is, when you think you know what the signal is, unplug it on the other end. <laughs> like and go back and forth. We've had people build this all out and the same signal was going out of a bunch of things and now they don't have any idea what's there. So there's a lot of confirmation and it really does help to have a, another person you know, on, a, on, on the other side that you can say, okay, now unplug that. Okay, now, yes, I can confirm that when you unplug that, I lost signal. You know, that kind of thing to make sure that you, you um, but it's really easy to step, cut corners and step over things and then you don't have any certainty. Now that's more for everyone else. I know that you know that, but but I, it's, I think that uh, that's the challenge. Go ahead, Jonas. I would not only get a portable monitor, but also a portable signal generator, so you can go yeah. to all the egress points and plug it in there and test it in both directions. Then also test how much you can send over that cable, because what you don't want to run into it's like a 1.5 G cable, and you're like, oh yeah, sure, we can send 1080p over that, but you need like a quad link and all that or a dual link. So I would get a test generator, plug it in there and check all the cables that way. And Courtney? Yeah, and if you go to their uh, website, uh, Dactronics has uh, software training and they, I see there's things for manuals and guides and a knowledge base there. So you can go there right on their website and figure out how all that uh, unique <laughs> custom software works. And Bill? And people were talking about signal testers. If you look in some of the big parts catalog things under signal generators or signal testers, you can find all sorts of systems. The big ones that test everything can run as much as five grand. So it's not a small thing. But the handheld portable ones like some of these folks have been talking about can be as low as three to five hundred dollars. So there's tools that can get the right signal down, whatever this plug is, or this input is to get it to an output that you can put a tester on there and see if it's coming through. And Alex. When Bill refers to the big ones, he's mo mostly we, we think of Fabrics. And the Fabrics ones are $5,000 used. <laughs> so so they're, they, they, they start there. They're between usually six and $7,000 all the way up to about 20 grand. And Another one to look at is Digital Forecast um, for measurement. Um, digital Forecast is a great, much more cost-effective solution to, to um, measure what you, what you have there. An important caveat. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Next question. John Preto comes to us from Las Vegas. And here on the panel, can Courtney articulate exactly how the teleprompters that politicians use work? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, they work pretty good, but the politicians' brains, <laughs> not so much. Um, basically, they uh, start with a display that is mounted facing up. I don't know if this can show you anything. So this is a typical presidential system. So you have a piece of glass that's up here that's at a 45 degree angle and it's pointed down and inside this little shielded place is a uh, monitor, an LCD monitor these days. These were CRTs in this picture, but uh, they're pointing up with a reversed image on it, <clears throat> like your regular teleprompter that we're all using here to look into. Uh, and uh, the glass is uh, uh, partially reflective 60 40 reflectivity so that they can look through that piece of glass and see the audience through it and the monitors have to be bright enough so that if the audience is lit the uh the words are superimposed across the faces of those uh smiling people out there in the audience uh so that's why and sometimes you'll see them outdoor you'll, you see them using outdoors they'll put a uh, backing on the glass to make it not completely transparent so it's uh, opaque but 100% reflective in that case so that they can see uh, see the monitor outdoors because if it's too bright outdoors you won't be able to see that uh, stuff superimposed and then you got to train the politician to start looking at one pick up their sentence and then when a break comes up in the text that's scrolling up uh, to look out in the middle and finish on the other one 
And if you speed those videos up of those politicians speaking with a teleprompter in the presidential style, you'll see them doing this as they speed up. <laughs> Looks like they're watching a tennis match, looking back and forth. That was so neat. Thank you, Courtney. Bill? And I used to think that a teleprompter meant that somebody couldn't think on their feet and do things. But then in the corporate world, we got into a lot of circumstances where either legal or compliance or some other division said, no, the CEO must say this. And they must say this exactly as it is written. It's been vetted by 72 people. And if they deviate at all, it could have an effect on our stock price. And suddenly you realize that in some circumstances, teleprompters are there to keep people out of serious trouble that can take down a company. Right. And Mitchell. I think it's important to point out that these devices, as pretty much uh, the way Courtney explained them, have been around a very long time, probably going back to the 60s. Uh, but uh, when I was a younger man and didn't know anything about uh, AV stuff, I always thought it was uh, some type of a security screen for the president. And Alex? I'm a big fan of if you're going to use teleprompter, tape it. <laughs> just, just give up on the live, you know. Like it's just, it's, it's, uh, it just feels unless you're really good at it. Like there's some folks that are really good at reading them, but not many. Next question. Next question comes to us from Dave Burke in Alexandria, Virginia. If I have a MacBook Pro with an additional monitor, not mirrored, and I add an ATEM Mini, can the ATEM show what's on each monitor? Can it treat each monitor as an individual source? Go ahead, Jason. Yes and yes, with caveats you're going to hate. Um, we, we, we'll leave it at that. Um, the answer is it is primarily an input device, not an output device, which means anything you want to be treated as an individual source needs to be split and then run directly back into the ATEM. Um, doing it any other way is just going to be weird, and um, even if you do that, it'll be weird. Um, I would go with a little bit of a better one. Uh, you do have one output if you decide to do this split and you can use that output to, you know, one at a time, set your, your output to be treated as its own source to, you know, be displayed on its own. But yeah, yeah. Ooh, don't go there. Nigel? Yeah, really just what Jason said. I think the external monitor is the easier problem to solve because you, if it's that external monitors on HDMI, uh, either through dongle or direct, depending which device you have. Um, it's easy, you buy a splitter, you split it, it, one goes to the monitor, one goes to the ATEM. The harder thing to do is the, the LCD screen of the laptop. Um, for that, you probably have to have another dongle, you have to mirror the laptop screen onto the dongle, and then send that to the ATEM. So it, it's a dongle world that you'll be living in. And Peter? I'll just... I'll just mirror what Jason and Nigel just said. I mean, I've done it. Um, but there's more extraneous little boxes hanging around when you do it than the MacBook Pro takes up. Space-wise, the MacBook Pro takes up. Uh, it does work. Monterey makes it a little easier because you can individually tell to mirror specific screens, specific sources to another source, to another sink, I should say. But well, you're 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 going to make this harder on yourself. Uh, simplest way is just to get a third screen and just do Display Port or uh, USB C to the to the screens with splitters and feed those into the uh, into the ATEM. Nice. Next question. Next one comes to us from David Kapaskin here in the panel from Miami, Florida. Getting a bunch of room noise with my Heil PR40 into the RCP2 using the default dynamic mic settings. Any suggestions? Jason? Um, I'll, I'll start with what you've probably already thought of, David, which is um, you need to be using a star quad cable. You need to be absolutely certain you have no ground loops. And I am kind of amazed that they have a default for all dynamic mics. That that kind of blows my mind. Um, I would say that it, it is almost certainly, you know, some sort of default EQ or default, you know, setting. And I would just turn it all off, start with that gain knob and um, see if you can normalize and go from there. Bill? 
To me, one of the most interesting days of my life is when I learned about what signal to noise ratio means in the real world. And that is because I didn't think so. I thought noise was always hums or crackles. But in truth, noise is anything you don't want. And the signal is the thing that you want. So achieving a good signal to noise ratio where no matter what that external distraction is, whether it's cars going by in traffic or whether it's a 60 cycle hum from a ground loop or whatever, whatever it is, your job, if you're trying to record clean audio is to get rid of what you don't want and emphasize what you do want. And in that respect, uh, look through your chain and say, what is this sound that I don't like? And once you identify what it is, if it is truly room noise and you're sure that that's it, I mean, if it's a, you, you can see the clock over there ticking and that you're hearing, and it's not just generally a whoosh that could be air conditioning or it could be something in the electronics noise, it will give you a hint as to how to suppress that noise to get just you there. With a the dynamic mic, I'm surprised you're having that much room noise problems because that's usually associated with the more sensitive condenser type mics. But I'm not saying it's impossible, but, you know, take off your headphones and things like that and listen to the room itself. Is it really that loud? And if not, maybe there's something else going on. Just some hints. Courtney? A couple of things, because I'm using the same uh, mixer here, the Rodecaster Pro 2, um, is... Um, Make sure you, you know, try turning off all the processing because it has that Apex processor in there that tends to boost up and, and uh, you know, do all kinds of gating. and uh, It has noise suppression and stuff built into it. And with that, uh, you have to turn up the gain really pretty high to use that Heil. And now the Rodecaster Pro 2 does claim that it has, you know, a 72 dB gain preamps to handle those uh, those particular uh, mics and make sure you're not using a, um, a cloud lifter or anything in between the microphone and the mixer because that will just uh, add of its own self noise uh, to the chain. The other thing is just move the microphone closer to you. And what I do with mine is I, I currently have all the processing turned off on that effect. So I'm not adding anything to the low end. I'm not rolling off anything. It's just flat. Uh, and not processing it at all. So try try that setting and uh, see if it cleans up your uh, room noise and get the microphone closer to you and then bring the gain down somewhat when you bring the microphone closer to you and that'll amplify less of the room noise around you. And Alex. And David, are, do you have a compressor applied? I, not anymore. I just turned everything off because, okay. because he told me to. Um, <laughs> So I don't, and, and, and interestingly enough, now I'm not hearing a lot of that room noise now that I turn all the processing off. So, so the, in the, inside the processing, I'm going to guess that there's a compressor and the compressor is the thing. If you're in a dynamic mic and you're hearing a lot of room noise, that's a very unusual, as, as was stated by Bill and Corey, that's super unusual to hear that. Um, and so it's almost always a compressor because what a compressor does, of course, is that it, you know, you have your your signal here and it basically presses down, it compresses, it basically says anything over, let's say 18 dB is gonna get a three to one compression. So if it was gonna be, you know, nine, it's not gonna be 15 or whatever, it's gonna be pushed down and then it gains it all up, you know, to, to stre it stretches it all back up again. So basically you're pushing your 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 core signal into the background and now, now that, that's good when you wanna reduce the, the dynamic range between the, the lows and the highs, but if you've got, room noise, it's going to pull all that room noise up into the system. So it's, it's, I'm going to guess it's a compressor. And Mitchell? I agree with uh, Alex on that. Uh, compressors tend to make sm small sounds louder and loud sounds smaller. Mm -hmm. So if you have a small background noise, it's trying to make it higher. So that's if the it's, problem. If it's it basically, if it's, if that background noise is, is in the threshold, you know, or near the threshold, it's going to get pulled up. So that's where you start. If you if you have control over your compressor, you're going to move that threshold up because that threshold, if it's like down, it basically if you want to think of it as like it's digging something out of the out of the background. That that digging might be something that's down at negative 18, but it could be down at negative 26 or you know whatever that is, and it's going to pull all of that up. It's 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 where that threshold is. It's going to decide yeah, you know what and it's the carving out. The ratio I kind of uh, use the same analogy is the size of the shovel you're using. <laughs> I love how David went through, uh, like as everyone spoke, he kept turning things off. So we got uh, live feedback <laughs> from him that it oh, now I works. Just, I just adjusted my threshold. I <laughs> oh, there you go. Yep, yep. The threshold is the key to the operation there. Perfect. Next question. 
Jason Bash in Albuquerque, New Mexico, up next. He says, has anyone played around with Sennheiser's Dear Reality software? It looks like they're trying their hand at spatial audio mastering and have a free spatializer plug-in. Mm, Alex. It looks interesting. Sennheiser has been working on uh, spatial audio for a long time. The Ambio line of mics that they that they put out and some of the stuff that they've been working on. I mean, I think they've been slowly building out this ecosystem. Um, so it's definitely not a new thing for them, but these new plugins look pretty cool, actually. Um, I think that uh, we're probably going to dedicate I think that I think that spatial is actually really important. I think that especially after Apple has promoted it and we see it in almost every movie and, you know, we're seeing more and more of it available in other places. I think that we need to really focus on that. So you'll probably see us talk about spatial about once a once a month, at least um, in the in the audio days. And so, so stay tuned for that. And Jonas. Yes, and I love it. Um, the cool thing is you can use it in vMix. So one of the mm-hmm. things that I've built last uh, year when Alex first started about office hours, we took uh, Zoom rooms because we already had isolated audio, took all the isolated audio and then put it into vMix and then put um, the DVR, the smallest one on all the channels and pent the people around so you could yeah. actually hear all the people being around you. Um, the music one is quite good. And then they also have one that tracks you with a VR goggles. It's it's really great and it works great. And Alex? One of the things that we've been experimenting with off and on for about a, a year now is um, the what we do with the in- interpretation tracks. And one of the things that we've been playing with, and we're just waiting for a couple things to roll out before we start using it more, but is putting the interpretation track in the surround so that you have, uh, you hear the person whispering to your ear about what in another language in the language that you want whether it's french or german or whatever while you're watching the english what's nice about that is that you're using up that spatial track your brain very quickly is able to manage it <laughs> like it's as if someone was talking next to you but you're still not losing you're not dubbing over something it's it's an added experience as opposed to a subtractive one next question Next question comes to us from Douglas Carmichael, and he notes, when Live Nation marketed their Live from the Drive-In, Drive-In Concerts in 2020, one selling point was proper professional PA. Since many of us have made shows happen in suboptimal situations, is professional about equipment, people, or both? Go ahead, Mitchell. I would say vote uh, both, uh, Douglas, because uh, you can't have one without the other. Um, equipment is self-limiting. So if you have professional equipment, you need professional people to run it. If you're setting up a line array and you got a front of house position and all of those things, you need professional people to know what they're doing. Uh, without them, uh, it would be a mess. And if you start seeing RCA plugs on the back of the gear that's on the stage, forget it. That's unprofessional. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, I don't think it was about either of those things. I think it was about marketing, period. They, if they were promoting that, they were trying to get picket, tickets sold by making that a feature. It's going to be loud and the sound's going to be good. Mm, good point there. Courtney? Well, I think that what they were trying to tell you was they aren't going to be using the little speaker you hang on your window in the car and the drive-in, that they're going to have a regular venue type uh, PA system set up around the screen. And the nice thing about it, using a drive-in, if there are any of them left anywhere, uh, is that uh, they're outdoors. So you don't have to deal with room acoustics or anything to tune those systems. And you'd set it up like you would an outdoor, uh, something in an outdoor amphitheater. And you have a PA company come in that does uh, sound for uh, professional gigs like that. And hopefully they get a multi-channel feed from their live stream and can route it into the speakers and create a complete surround situation for the people that are standing in the drive-in and then the neighbors don't complain. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, and I, and I do think that what they're tr- I think that Live Nation probably wouldn't put their name on it if they weren't bringing in a pretty heavy-duty uh, sound system. If they're going to say that they're bringing professional PA, it's, it's probably more than what your DJ would bring, um, which a lot of right at the beginning of COVID, I think part of this is a reaction to a lot of drive-ins were taking advantage of this process and just kind of throwing up some speakers and doing the best they could and putting on radio. So I think that telling people that, and to Courtney's point, you absolutely can do five, uh, 5.1 um, in uh, the 5.1.2 or 4 is really hard outside, um, <laughs> but, but the other ones are relatively possible. <laughs> <laughs> drones holding yeah. on to the speakers on balloons <laughs> yeah, exactly. i so want to do that now that i said it i so want to like <laughs> why did i visual based. that too well, i have one 
The, it'd be the first 514 outdoor outdoor show. I, maybe, maybe not the first one. Someone's got to have done that before, but I can't. we can't be the first people to think of it. Anyway, the point though. And in the chat, Tim McCullough says, it's meant to the extent possible that it's replicating typical concert experience. So going back to what Bill said, just the marketing around it. All right, next question. Next question comes up from Mitchell Hill in Wilmington, Delaware, here on the panel. Can I report success with incorporated and uh, incorporating an EDID sync on my TV monitor? How do you use this hack to fix handshaking? Go ahead, Mitchell. Here he goes answering his own question. Uh, last week I asked, how do I fix the problem I have with my direct TV talking to my receiver, which talks to my monitor, because it would it would act weird uh, when it was trying to establish uh, handshaking, and then it would eventually show a message, your TV is not compatible with this uh, input. And the solution was to get this small little HDMI device uh, that's a 4K device that plugs into the back of the direct TV receiver and then provides a sync for the direct TV that thinks that it's talking to your TV. And you can teach the little device to think uh, what TV it's uh, connected to. So if you plug your TV directly into the uh, device, that becomes the uh, learning capability of the device. You push the learning button, the little blue light blinks, then it goes steady. And now your TV or your direct TV thinks it's talking to that TV, even if there's a receiver uh, in between interfering with the handshaking. So that hack worked pretty well for me. Okay, Alex. Who makes it? You didn't tell us. You told us. That oh it works. gosh, I can't. Re- it was an Amazon one. There's like a whole bunch of them. I'll post it. Okay, Sounds awesome. Good. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah, I was wondering if it is the uh, Geffen HDMI Detective Plus, which uh, automatically generates an EDID and stores it uh, so that it's consistent. Um, they've been making one for a long time that does that uh, a EDID emulator. I wonder if that was that the, is that the one you used? Mitchell's coming back to answer. Uh, no. Um, here's what I learned in doing the research is um, a lot of them are still 1080 only. They're not uh, 4, uh, 4K. Uh, so I did not use the Geffen. Um, also, there's a huge uh, swing of prices for these devices. I went with a small little inline uh, device that was very simple to use. The Geffen is a box that does what it does. Geffen makes a lot of great stuff, but uh, no, I didn't use it. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, last night I was improvising some electronic music into After Hours. Considering I don't want to monopolize the channel, would you recommend Twitch or YouTube? I haven't been on Twitch in six months, but other electronic musicians that I know do use it. Alex? First of all, uh, Douglas, I, I heard a little bit of that. And it sounded pretty good. Um, I, I would, uh, if you want to schedule the time when you're playing it, one of the things we'd love to do is if you're gonna if you're gonna work on that stuff, we'd love to see you work on it. So look, rather than just listening to it, we know that you're composing it. Figure out a way to screen share or show us what what software you're in and how you're putting it together. Um, but happy to schedule something in, in there for a, you know a breakout room or something like that where people can hang out um, in there, or you could play a little of it there and then go into another room. But let us know. Uh, I would use YouTube. As far as the as far as the um, uh, the platform to stream to. Next question. Guy Cochran in Seattle wonders what cameras have an Ethernet port that allows for IP control of all of the menus. Go ahead, Jonas. Yeah, so one of the cameras uh, that I know Guy has and I and a couple other people really like is the BGH one. It has an Ethernet port. It has all the ports you would want from a small little box camera. Um, you see one behind me, I have one in my hand, and one is the one you are watching me on is also it. And they created this little um, application so you can control everything over Ethernet. It's also power over Ethernet. And so you have all your typical settings. I can uh, change the ISO and all that. But the cool thing is you can also uh, pull focus. You can zoom in, zoom out, even has a way to... Um, customize that you can put some overlays on top if you need to match it to another shot. And one of the coolest things that I've seen is if you go to the menu, it actually shows you the menu on here. So you can do all the things where you then would need to go there. I can now go in here and say, today I want to record on 4K. Um, And this is one of the best implementations of remote control I've seen. Um, The Ccam also offers it. But their implementation is a lot more clunky and especially being able to control the menu like this is really great. And yeah, it's, it's a great camera. 
there's a request for you to post a link in the chat, please. And thank you, oh. <laughs> Mitchell. There's a reason you want that. I mean, if you're using uh, your camera with a Zoom call, in my case, I've got the monitors set up here and the cameras uh, behind the uh, teleprompter. And it's just a pain to get to the back of it to, to mess with the menu. These things are great. Um, unfortunately, my Sonys don't have Ethernet. So for those of you that don't have Ethernet, um, there's a application that runs really well on the Sony. It's called Monitor Plus. And it will talk to it via wireless, or if you have an Android phone, it will plug directly into the USB port. Um, it can let you see the camera, adjust the uh, focus, uh, adjust the color, anything you can do with the menu on the back of the unit. So now you got it in front of you while you're looking at yourself in your prompter on Zoom, and uh, it works great. And Courtney. Yeah, if you have a Canon camera like I do, they they have an app that uh, runs on iOS or, or Android called Camera Connect. And it... Um, <clears throat> It's a single app. It works with the EOS, the PowerShot, and the Vixia cameras. And you can basically control a lot of the camera function uh, directly from the app. And it connects either over Wi-Fi if the camera supports Wi-Fi directly or, or Bluetooth. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, with IKEA selling furniture designed for music producers at home, could you see a property developer making their residences specifically appeal to the creative and or work from home market? For example, Ethernet in every room, fiber to the premises, Internet and so forth. Go ahead, Alex. I've actually talked to some developers about that. <laughs> so like they, they we, we were brought in to talk to them about what, you know, as they look at um uh, that work for home, like what is important. So they were asking us, you know, like to tell us. And a lot of what we were talking about is building out like one of the bedrooms, really designing it. It wasn't really how to run Ethernet to every room or how to run fiber, but defining a, a specific room that was going to be a little bit more, a uh, little bit more taken care of. So, um, you know, so because it, it gets very costly. We're, this is what I learned working with with developers is they have a problem where they have, when they pour concrete, they have to measure the thickness of the concrete because the, the, the construction crew sometimes will cut, will shave off like an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch of thickness to the, to the concrete to save money. That's, I mean, this is the kind of mar margins that they work at, and, 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 you know, of people thinking about it. So when you say, oh, you should run fiber to every room, that looks like a lot of money to them. Like, like they're like, you know, oh, that's, that's a thing, you know. But if you say, hey, one room should be more insulated against sound. And should have fiber ethernet you know fiber or ethernet to it um ethernet specifically we were talking about cat 7 um just just to put it in but should be properly set up for that should be a little thicker um th think about the windows being triple paned um think about the you know um the uh, structure in the in the ceiling so you can hang things and so a lot of folks are that are building new products are definitely thinking about um, building out at least a room. And then a lot of them are starting to get little server rooms built into them. You know, that like it's a little, it's, it's a closet, but with a rack, you know, so, so, you know, just cause people, more people are doing it. And then it, then they're, then they can sim simply push those subsystems into that closet. Um, you know, so that every, you know, cause everybody now has a Wi-Fi router. So give them somewhere to put it, you know, like that's the, that's central to the house. That's easy to get to. That's there. So, so those are some of the things, the more aggressive things that we've requested that I don't think anyone's doing is, is really adjustable walls, you know, being able to um, snap on different, you know, inside of specific ones, having subsystems that allow you to change the nature of the wall. So if you want to make some soft for some period of time or, or different, you know, you can do those things. And so those are some of the things that we've had discussions with developers about. The ones that they're most interested in is a room that is built as your, that they can promote as your work from home office, but could also just be a bedroom. Go ahead, Noah. I haven't bought a house yet, but when I do, I'm hoping to do fiber in every room as well. I think that's super crucial and super important. I do have a client who, um, they, they're a corporate company that basically buys single family um, houses and they manage those at scale. And they basically have an HOA fee on top of that for maintenance and what have you. And um, a couple of their complexes where they have, you know, several dozen houses, they're you know, obviously there's like rec rooms and pools and that kind of stuff. Now they're introducing um, essentially Zoom rooms, right? Like business offices with insulation and like dedicated spaces um, around um, what we're talking about now. But I think it's a good idea. I think um, more folks are going to move towards that. And, you know, just like we used to have like a bonus room or a media room, right? That could be our Zoom room in the future. And Nigel? Yeah, I think it depends what type of developer you're talking about. If you're finding a developer who produces, mass produces homes, 
then they're going to look for a model they can repeat and they're going to minimize the amount of stuff they put in it. it at this sort of other end of the scale, you've got people who are building spec homes that they, you know, they own the land, they build a house, and then they want to sell it to someone. And depending on the size of that, you're going to find those houses are properly cabled, are properly wired, they're properly done that way. It also depends on the size of the house. If you're building a 1,500, 2,000 square foot house, then what Alex said is absolutely right. They're going to do uh, that type of work. If you're building a four or 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 square foot house, then not only do you need a closet for your data center, you're also going to have to have cabling with multiple wireless access points in it because because now you're building a fairly substantial infrastructure both for cabling and for power last thing i'll tell you is there is a there's a sort of mini craze of what we would call a virtual presence room which is take room potentially a bedroom the the fourth or fifth or third bedroom you're not going to use and invest in that as your home theater as your telepresence for your conference rooms and try and try and make a room that the whole family can use throughout the day that is quickly reconfigured to do that and Mitchell it's a great question Douglas uh, it's a real thing a work from home office I like that term um I've had people call them media centers, media rooms, uh, huddle rooms. Um, I'm getting a lot of uh, corporate clients asking um, how they can set up a Zoom room or, a, you know, it's like a phone booth. And I say, well, don't do a phone booth. Do a little room where it's comfortable so you want to spend time in it. But um, it, it is a thing, and I think it's going to be more and more of the thing, especially in the home, because it's very hard to retrofit these things. I live in a condo, and I've spent years uh, getting wiring, Ethernet wiring to every one of the rooms, and it's a real pain. And Alex? And the folks that I was talking to are mostly apartment complexes, so they're not really looking at, I mean, these are like one, two, three bedroom apartments um, that they want to center, you know, they wanted to make, let's make all of them, you know, really two or three bedrooms. One of those bedrooms is kind of, you know, and they, to your point, uh, they, Nigel, they, they want to systematize it. They don't want it to be like, oh, you have to ask for it later. It's just all the rooms are built this way for a certain way, and they can promote it. The other thing that some folks in the apartment complexes are seeing is that they can make more money now with work for home if they um, build their own IT services. And so basically there, you can get Comcast if you want, that's fine. And Comcast doesn't like this at all. So they can't go through the, the normal ones, but they're going to Cogent uh, Level 3 or, or Lumen, um, putting in one gig, 10 gig, you know, connections into um, the, the apartment complex, being willing to manage it and take on the liability that that, that does because they can charge the clients, um, you charge the, the folks there the same that the cable's charging. <laughs> so they're buying in bulk and making it available because then they can actually um, uh, make sure that the a complex is, because what they have right now is a lot of unhappy tenants who can't get the internet that they need for what they're doing. And they, they see the opportunity to charge them $100, $150, $200 a month <laughs> so, that they, so they can connect to, to work, you know, and have it be up and down. And then they just get a 10 gig connection into the building. And so that's, um, that's starting to, to happen as well. And Courtney. There was a question for Nigel too, that uh, I was wondering if, if these new homes, these spec homes, especially the large footage, square footage ones, if they have a separate place, I would see that there would be a problem if you're going to try and dual use your family theater or your theater room that you're going to use with a, maybe a big screen projection and some nice comfortable seating. Um, if you use that for your two-way communications or your business communications, it would you seem to be competing with the kids who want to be playing video games right in the middle of your video conference. So I would say they would probably have a separate room that's sound isolated and has its own feed, uh, its own router, so that you're not sharing bandwidth with the kids that are you know playing first-person shooters in the in the home theater. Uh, and, you know, you don't need uh, extensive, you don't need a big screen projection for doing, uh, you know, meetings or Zoom meetings. Uh, you just need a, a decent background and uh, a well padded space so that just not doesn't sound like you're in a closet and, uh, and a decent sized monitor and a teleprompter. And Nigel, real quick. I think the answer to that depends on how big the house is. And if the house is big enough, it'll have its own separate home theater. If the house isn't big enough, then the family tries to share this as much as they can. Next question. 
Next one comes to us from Guy Cochran again. Oh, I'm sorry, from John Preto in Las Vegas. This one says, received from a fellow engineer, I just watched an MMA, Mixed Martial Arts event from 1FC.com that utilized 180-degree 6K cameras to allow the event to be viewed in Oculus Quest 2 VR on the Horizon Venues platform. It was incredible. Anybody know about this? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, John, was it in stereo or, or mono? I didn't see it. I just got this email and I'm like, Alex has to know something about this. Oh yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's, um, the, uh, yeah, we, we actually, oh, and I know streams, streams to venues. So, um, so the live execution is, uh, generally a single, um, it's mono, you know, monoscopic, uh, 180 degree field of view so that you feel like you're sitting there and you can, you're conscious people on either side of you. Um, there, then you can get records that you can actually watch, um, that are, uh, stereo 180 and tend to be a little bit uh, higher resolution just because of the nature of live versus post. One of the things that's really interesting to watch, one of the things in the market that's interesting to watch is the the new Canon R5 with the stereo um, lensing. So they have a, the, 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 the R5 now has a stereo lens set that's 180 degrees that you can literally put on the front of the camera and capture both left and right in the same full frame sensor, um, which is, is a really exciting move to be, you know, a lot of Sinking everything back up again and making it all work has been a thing. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, being able to have a single camera that can do that is is a pretty big deal. And so, uh, definitely, this is a, a place that's moving pretty quickly. But the the venues has been around for the last four or five years. Um, but the uh, but um, they're continually making it much you know better and better. Courtney, real quick. Yeah, I'm not sure how you would want to have a 360 cam if you're outside the cage. The real hot ticket would be to have a little thing that each of the fighters wears that has a 360 cam on top of their head <laughs> so that you see the punches coming right into your face and you can just pick which fighter you want to have the perspective of. That would yeah, be really cool. The reality is, is that the, what you really want is to be within about 15 feet of the action because after that resolution and everything else starts to fall off and you don't see as much dimension, um, but in 3D at least, and, and definitely these other ones based on the resolutions we get right now, um, you know, getting the camera, maybe not on the fighter, but on the octagon, you know, right on one of the corners. And I don't know whether that's what they're doing or not, but getting it somewhere that it's relatively close um, makes a huge difference in the experience. Next question. Next one comes to us from you, from Liberty White. Alex, what's changed with your video? It looks sharper and bolder. Bold. <laughs> oh, did? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what I did. I, here's the only thing I did is I, I moved my, my lights around. I was experimenting with not having the lights, um, not having the lights all right. They were clustered all right in front of me. Okay. And it was harder to see my teleprompter. I've been tweaking my teleprompter. And so I... I moved them out of the way so they're on either side. So I guess that must be the, but I think that's the only thing I, uh, that's the only thing I did. Yeah, yeah so I think, I think then it's works. probably the lights. Yeah, good job. Excellent. Oh, Thanks. looks like John. No, oh, it's the blue shirt. He's never worn that blue shirt before. <laughs> the blue shirt's there too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, most of my, most of my shirts are very desaturated and I, uh, this is my outside, this is, this is because I'm running to get a flight. This is my outside shirt. The other shirts you see literally sit on a hanger right here that they just put <laughs> I just put them on. And Mitchell? Maybe Alex is just sharper and bolder today than normal. <laughs> Action. <laughs> Next question. Shurig Cheetah from Dallas says, what is uh, the AWS cloud formation and how do you use it? Jonas? AWS cloud formation is their offering for infrastructure as code. So what that means is you can codify and develop what infrastructure you want to bring up. We use it a lot for automation with our instances. So what you can do is say, I want three EC2 instances. I want a virtual private network that is this way. I want a VPN connection here. I want the internet traffic to go out here. And you can also make the customizable. In IT, that's a lot of times used also because you don't want to have to do all the manual steps because there's a lot of issues if you have to repeat the manual step and then the intern that had to do the manual step forgot the one click and suddenly your production server is done. Um, it's used to deploy your resources in a more efficient manner and you can use YAML or JSON to describe it. Next question. Next one comes again uh, from Jonas Dattel in Stuttgart. What are people missing most from the Hyperdex at the moment? Mitchell. First, I wish they worked. Uh, but other than that, uh, <laughs> being able to manage to playlist the file uh, structure on there, setting uh, tops and tails, 
I think that's missing. I think we talked about that in after hours and before the show the other day, uh, Jonas, and um, it would be great if somebody created a specific con- uh, application just to do that. Or as Alex said, um, I think it was Alex or maybe Courtney, um, combine the D- SDK from ATAM and the Ethernet protocol that uh, can talk to them and put them together all in uh, one spot and have that uh, be the control. Jason? I'll start with one of the things that I absolutely adore that the HyperDeck does. Um, I plugged it into my four um, unit, you know, hard drive rack mounted array. And much to my surprise, I, I truly can just plug in SD um, drives and our SSD drives and, and it truly will work just right out of the gate. And, and that works as far as I can tell across just about every HyperDeck I have, which is most of them. Um, what I would love would be to be able to use my jog wheel um, on my cheap hyperdeck for my more expensive hyperdecks. I would absolutely adore that. Um, and it seems a doable thing, but who knows? And John. Yeah, I had you know, just pull my hair out of my head getting the hyperdeck to work. And it drops uh, it drops connection a lot from the eight from the eight ten software. It just won't find the hyperdeck anymore. So it's it's been frustrating. Next question. Next one comes from James Babbitt in San Diego. He says, which power banks are compatible with the Shocks Bluetooth earphones? The anchor power banks shut off. Okay. Looks like we uh, – okay, Bill. I'm going to take a, a, a stab at it. I don't know particularly. I use a lot of different anchor power banks, almost all of them. There's only a, really a couple of standards for power out. Bluetooth uh, has its kind of standard. I will say that just based on the fact that Apple makes so many different chargers for so many different things, particular devices do require a certain amount of current and or uh, specifications to successfully charge. And I wonder if in this case, the power banks that you're trying to use are just underpowered somehow for the draw of that device. I, I'm not sure about that, but it's the only thing I can think of, which is why in a system uh, you would plug in a standard power supply to a standard device and it wouldn't function. That that seems weird to me because most everything works with everything. And then Courtney. And what may be happening is that there's probably very little current draw on those uh, earphones. So what you might want to do is plug something else into the anchor as well. So share that power uh, with a a hub or a USB power hub or something so that it's powering more than just the aftershocks because a lot of the uh, the, uh, um, power banks will power off if they don't detect a current drain on them. So maybe it's not detecting enough of a current drain with those headphones and it's just going to sleep. And we'll wrap with Bill. And I just thought of one more thing. It's possible that whatever the little batteries are in those earbuds is failing or is close to the end of life. And so I've had circumstances where you plug something in, it looks like it's charging for a couple of seconds, then it goes off. And I found that to mean that the batteries are just dying in it. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for we've come to the end of our first hour and all of your questions. And we're moving into now talking about content planning. And the idea for this next hour is to go ahead and answer any of your questions that you have around. This is the time typically when people are looking at, okay, how did we do, you know, this is a mid mid year review. So how did the content that we put out during the year, how did that work for the first half? Hopefully you've been doing this monthly, so it hasn't. It's not going to be too much lifting on your part. But if not, this is a great opportunity to go over your content and doing what we'll start with saying is a content audit. And essentially, that audit is going through. In a this would be a great opportunity. Let's see here. So when you look at your marketing, and oh, there it is. Awesome. So yes, your marketing, if you look at it overall at the top, and sometimes people, when you think of like marketing, content, advertising, a lot of the lines blur. But when we're talking about your your content marketing, sorry, let's put that there. You're looking at, okay, do you have blogs going? What's happening with your website? Uh, are you doing a podcast? All of the tentacles, every way that you are actually putting content out into the world, this is where you are looking at how is it performing, especially as it relates to your 
overall plan? Because typically this is, depending on the size of your organization, there is possibly you have a communications team and that team is looking at the content that you, not just the content, but your communication strategy over for the entire year and for your brand. And so they're, they're overseeing all of those verticals. But if you are responsible for now looking at your content and and drilling down there, this is where it's an opportunity for you to go back and look at your reports, Um, whether that on your website, you hopefully have Google Analytics running. So you go back and look at what pages are people looking at? How much time are they spending? What is the bounce rate? And bounce rate essentially means that when they you're looking at how long they're on that page and how quickly they leave. And sometimes people make the mistake of, well, okay, well, the if the bounce rate is really high, well, then this page is not working. That might not be the case. There may be some things where is the content on that page need to be updated. You've uh, is it that they found the information really quickly? So therefore they are not spending as much time on that page. So there are a couple of questions that you would want to ask yourself, but this is the time where you can also go through your social media. As I said, that, that vertical, how's your social working? And I want, and a reason I specifically said that, you know, we're talking about content planning because Social media is not the only type of content that you're putting out in the world, which is why I said, what's happening with your website? Are you getting the responses? Are people hitting that contact us? Or is there a specific landing page that you're trying to drive traffic to? This is that time that you take all of that data, all of that information, spread it out. So give yourself, if you are thinking about how long should this take, well, it depends on your resources. If you are a solopreneur, um, as many of you might be freelancing and or a one person, one, two person shop, it may take a little bit longer because you don't necessarily have that. I can carve out, you know, two weeks for this. So it may take a few weeks to do it together. Just set a date, maybe every Monday, you just spend some time going through and and doing that audit because it will take just a little bit longer. Or maybe you don't need to do a deep, deep dive and you're just like, okay, I just need to get started with this. And this is where when you do that audit and looking at what's performing well and where you might need to revisit and, and, you know, change path. And that's where your Google Analytics, if you are using tools like Hootsuite, that's a a social media platform, they should be, these tools are also spitting out reports. So you might not have looked at the reports. So this is a challenge. Um, If you are using planning tools to go and spit out some reports so that it will help you then so that you'll be able to make some some very conscious decisions. Um, Or, and I'll use Tony Mobley as an example. So hopefully Tony Tony, you're okay with this, but just at a very high level, their ability to look at how their YouTube, Tony, looking at Tony's brand overall, it is, okay, Tony does a weekly broadcast, Conversations with Tony Mobley. Um, They've got a, so they've got a website and they've got the live show on YouTube. And then sometimes Tony will do social media. So Right now, you think of that as like that being the extent of what Tony is. That's what he's going to be auditing for his content. So from the website, that's where he's going to want to look at, well, how many people are visiting each week? And when they are visiting, what pages are they going to? And when you look at those pages, are those pages doing what, you know, the end business goal may be? For Tony right now, it might be brand awareness or it just might be, hey, are they filling out our form, whatever those actual goals or objectives that he and the conversations with Tony Mobley crew have, they'll look into that. Then going on to YouTube, this is an opportunity for him to look into, okay, how long, what's the watch time? How long are people watching our our shows? How many comments? That's when you start getting a little more granular. How many comments do we have? And also what are the top performing shows and seeing if your comments and if your comments match that. And then what you want to do is take all of that valuable information and then see 
what patterns that you can find and see ways where you can you start making like grouping things together and then, OK, maybe we need to talk more on this topic or maybe we need to go another way and have a little um and just switching, because if it's not meeting business goals, uh, I'll say that there because uh, a lot of us are working with clients who they're looking at the bottom line. They're trying to figure out why things are or aren't working. Um, if you see that there's a disconnect with the actual goal you set out for, you know, set out for your show, then this is that opportunity that you have to to make some adjustments, adjustments, maybe try out some new topics um, there. And the other one again, speaking about Tony is your social media and doing an audit there. And that's pretty self-explanatory and easy because then you'll be able to look at, you know, Facebook. I believe Tony has said in the past, LinkedIn is something that works really well for him. So the content that he's putting on LinkedIn, hmm, can we test that out on Facebook and or double down on the content that he's putting out on LinkedIn. And that's just a very high level way of when you're doing your audit, it really is just looking at this is the measuring stick of like, where are we right now? So that we have a baseline to think about that. Noah, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. I, I think a lot of what you're talking about, too, is helpful in the sense of like um, adding structure and adding systems and placing and seeing that they're all pillars that help support the bigger show and the and what you're trying to do ultimately. And so, um, but yeah, working backwards from the goal in mind and then figuring out what steps you need to create and execute on that goal is super helpful. Um, I often describe and think about like buckets of topics or like, you know, breaking down a, a thing into a little sections essentially. And so um, not that I'm an expert at um, content planning, but I'm super excited to, to talk and hear about this. For me, I, I honestly have like three perspectives in mind too. I have like from a YouTuber, right? Someone who has a very small channel that um, I'm hoping to come back to and create content around that. Like how do I strategize and implement that? And then also from a small business perspective, how do I generate content that um, it serves the and gives value to the community, but also to potential clients, right? And, and that it'll be seen by people and also help people in that sense. And then finally, I, I have a third pr um, project now that I've just taken on. So there's a, a small city um, that has a local access channel. And so we're developing content for that. So they have like yoga classes and cooking classes and stuff that we want to develop. And so um, that's kind of what I have in the back of my mind as we're talking through today. Oh, that's great. And just even with you saying, even with the, the latter part, and you already know this, but for the sake of those that are, are listening as well, when you start a new project and you are responsible for what that content looks like, just understanding who your stakeholders are that you're dealing with, because everybody has, they hear content through a different lens. So some it's content just of like, just getting that information out there, your their possible marketing team and or any, um, I would say some higher ups, the C-suite, they're looking, they could potentially be looking at, well, how much revenue, <laughs> you know, how much revenue is coming through the door where when you're looking at your content plan, this is where you're responsible for, okay, or do we have the proper call to actions? Because you can be putting a lot of great content out there, but if there's no way to bring those people into your ecosystem, whether it be your now, your newsletter, that being a part of that, you know, your marketing strategy, bringing them into some other way, um, some other community where you can now then not only serve them in a more responsible or in a, in a better way, but then also be able to gather data so that you can then ask questions around them and start loyalty programs and kind of, you know, there's like a whole um, rabbit hole you could go down with there. But yes, understanding who your stakeholders is extremely important when you get into that part of, um, of the content planning. Bill? I'm going to 100% uh, re uh, amplify what you said. Also, though, the reality of 
do you truly understand what your audience wants or are you coming at things from a perspective of what you've done before that's worked before and thinking that those things are going to always make the same difference they made in situation A now that you're in situation B? Uh, is your view of what the audience needs the actually correct one? And I'm constantly asking myself that question because I bring a set of tools that have worked for me in circumstances throughout my career. That doesn't mean they're necessarily completely applicable to what's needed right now. Now, it's kind of the inside versus the outside view. And if I'm coming from the outside, do I fully understand the client well enough to fit my solutions into their needs? Or am I trying to impose my solutions on their needs, which is a different thing? Sometimes that can work if, they, if they're off target and uh, an expert comes in and really does reveal something that is organically wrong with their operation and can send them in a new direction, that can really boost the effectiveness of what they're offering. Uh, but it's a matter to me of curation. It's a matter of trying to always stop at the beginning and say, are the tools I'm bringing to this the right tools for this client? And am, or am I fooling myself into thinking that the way I solved it five years ago is going to be the right way to solve it now when the entire environment may have changed? I mean, ideas actually are easy. Good, effective ideas are a lot right. harder. And not mistaking one for the other is very carefully difficult. Yeah. And Bill, you actually hit on something um, really important, too, that I probably should have said um, just even earlier is when you are looking at your content marketing, this is something that is consistent as well, that you are constantly looking at how, what the information that we're putting out into the world for our audience, how are we able to consistently share? And this is where you get into messaging and sharing your brand, but it's all of those touch points and the content that helps you with those touch points. Again, going back to where I had the verticals of like your blog, your video. Um, there is a, a young lady who's now the um, content marketing director for User IQ. She used to intern with me like 12 years ago. So I'm super proud um, of her, but they are a SaaS based product. And for them, what they do very, very well is they almost have like a weekly Zoom and that's their their lead magnet. That's not only helping them to create content, but they invite people who use their tool, prospective clients or users, and they teach or there's some sort of thought leadership that they do around that. So that content then now is able to double as something they can put on their blog. But then it actually, again, the pipeline that I was referring to of bringing in leads, bringing in people who you can then provide information to them, but then you capture their email and then now they're part of your, a part of your email list. And because of these prospective clients, they also do a lot of white papers. Um, white papers basically being really um, well-researched blogs, if you <laughs> to put it very, very simply, well-researched blogs or papers um, that could be anywhere from a couple of pages to upwards of like 10, 20. Um, but this is really intense or, or valuable information, I should say, that your end client would need. So there's just like all of these, these spaces and verticals that play into content marketing, but to kind of tie a bow and to help make it really simple, depending on wherever you are and it does come to your planning, you really want to think about, you know, first is audit and audit the info, whatever you have right now, then what are your resources? Because that's going to be important because you can come up with the greatest ideas out there and like, yes, we're going to start doing weekly broadcasts or going live or we'll go live every day like office hours. But if you are not able to sustain that, that's going to then impact your customer, you know, your customer service, your customer relationship. So you want to think about auditing where you are right now, just whatever that baseline is. Um, what resources do you have available to you, whether that be financial? Um, budgeting wise, whether that be talent, who else can you maybe farm out some work to if you are a small a smaller team or if you're a larger team, um, who else can you you lean on? And then the actual like the planning and the execution to actually 
get that get that content, like Bill said, to get that content out the door. So uh, I think this was a great time to dive into some questions as we start thinking through planning and helping you with the end of the second half of the year or even getting getting started. This is a great time to get started for 2023. Go ahead, Bill. Okay, our first question comes from Morgan Price in Victoria Beach, or Victoria, British Columbia. Sorry about that. How do you approach planning content for a short series or a podcast season on a common theme or topic? How do you approach dividing up content into different episodes and so forth? For example, YouTube or podcasts. Go ahead, Bill. Well, for me, it always starts with some form of outlining because I'll always have ideas. I wouldn't have approached, you know, doing this series if I hadn't already kind of dreamed through some of the things I might want to do. And I've learned to 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 trust myself in that if I just start the process and work it as a process, I'll eventually come up not with just enough, but frighteningly way too much. And actually, that's a piece of what I wanted to talk about. When I start outlining something, I, the process is first structural, but then every single time I when I write a, a, a sub part of my outline, I think, ooh, ooh and I want to say, and it's really easy for me to get stuck on expanding on that. So I actually have to put a limit. I say I'm going to give myself one minute to put a note down below this. But as the minute is over, I have to go back to my outline because I find it's like squirrel the the content creation of what I want to say later distracts me from my task at hand, which is to build the outline, the bones and structure. And look, I also tend to ignore if I'm putting in just my thoughts of what the show or the, the endeavor should be. I tend to miss things like, oh, it was July and I could have done something on Independence Day as a theme there, but I was jamming my thoughts of what the show structure should be. And I'm not paying attention to anything outside of what my thoughts are. And so at some point, opening myself up to understanding calendaring or events in the industry or something else that might be a natural way to create content that's tied to something other than my own preconceived notions, I like to make sure that I try to get that in there. That outlining, outlining is huge for me. Very good point. Those rabbit holes will get you, if nothing else. Noah? Yeah, I love how Bill just described how he loves the detail work and getting, you know, the flushed out ideas and going through the things that he's passionate about and comfortable with. But then he realizes that you got to take a step back and get the 10,000 foot view. Um, and I feel like that's one of the things I love to do as well. I remember back in college, um, there was a sitcom called Peppuccinos that I helped uh, create and and push out together um, with with a large group of students from our university. Um, and I remember some of our writers, super talented, um, but they they could only write like one scene at a time, right? So they're really focused on that one scene and they could flush out great dialogue and, and do that. But um, they didn't always see how that scene would fit into the bigger picture. And so I had another writer, Lindsay Duke, who um, ultimately helped us shape the epi episodes together. And then my job was to look at the arc of the whole season, right? And so coming back to your podcast comment, you're ultimately a storyteller. And so you have to make sure that there's some sort of through arc right throughout all of the episodes and all of the themes um, throughout the whole season. At least that, that would be my encouragement to you, even if it's a podcast or a YouTube series, something that carries from one thing to the next, because ultimately it's storytelling. Um, another thing is the old format was a time based thing. So like, a, you know, a 30 minute show would actually have like 22 and a half minutes of content or something. And then like an hour long show on television would have like 42 minutes. Those times no longer are relevant, right? For the um, new media approach where you're on YouTube or Netflix or what have you. So that's why you see different lengths of shows on Netflix. Um, it's because we're not holded hold to held to that format. <laughs> um, and we can kind of break those time barriers and focus on the story arc. And Bill. Noah just reminded me, yeah, there's a word, cliffhanger. And the reason it's a word is because that is how original content creators left you wanting to come back again, which is exactly the heart of building an audience. If you never leave the audience with a question that they feel unresolved about, there's really no reason for, oh, great, I watched the show, I'm done. <laughs> Why should I come back for another one? Well, you hope you build a reputation that it's a good story, but if you can work in elements of dramatic foreshadowing or something that causes them to want to come back, follow a character they love or follow an idea to its natural conclusion that helps that arc. 
Yeah. And going back to maybe even synthesize some of what has shared, what we do oftentimes is doing a mind map. And what that could essentially look like is say there are some topics that you do want to deal with. So you start here in the center with topic X, and I probably shouldn't put that over my face. So I'll move to the side over here, but topic X, and you just to Bill's point, you know, put that timer on and give yourself like maybe five minutes and then you start just dumping out all these different themes and ideas, then give yourself another. And this is if you want to do a sprint, give yourself now once you've put all of those ideas out there, then start looking at, OK, so from, you know, let's say this is office hours. So, so let's just say it's, you know, video. So then now what else can we talk about video? And you keep branching off into and now all you do is you're like honing in and you're focusing on video and what all of those topics and subject matters that can that you can have and once you you know exhausted that give again time wise because the idea is that you are getting all of those i getting all of those concepts out of your out of your head and then you go on to the next one and then if it's you know if it's audio and spend some time and branch off and what you'll find is at the end of it is that you'll be able to then now find like the cream of the crop of all of that and you've given yourself time to get all of that out of, out of your head and typically figure out are you a morning person is that when you work really well or is it you know an afternoon person and just get into your genius zone and allow that stuff because when you're under pressure to figure that stuff out, y you probably will not come up with as as the quality of content that you want to do. But by doing by mind mapping or brain, people call it brain dumping, um, whether you do it free form whiteboard, that is just a, a great way to then help you to really hone in and really pull out those key gems that your audience um, that will work for them. And then you get a chance to put that up against maybe a calendar of the year and the calendar of events, because then you can be able to plan, oh, this episode would sync really well with X time of year. And then you can get some of the benefits of some SEO as well, because, you know, if you've got your podcast, you put it out on uh, a blog and then Google has added. So just um, some really good ways of just kind of thinking and, and formatting that. So let's know how that works out for you. Next question. Morgan Price in Victoria, British Columbia is right back from Canada with what have been your most memorable collaborations with content experts while content planning and what worked really well? Go ahead, John. We have a 20 year old podcast, mostly for fun, called Nerd World. Courtney was on it. Bache was on it. Greg Curta was on it. We had a um, we had a professor on after the observation of gravitational waves back in September of 2015. And the event happened. And what I did was I sent about 15 emails out to PhDs in physics. And two guys replied back to me to, to come on the show. And I had this professor of uh, physics on on the show explaining about how the interferometer worked and, and the explanation of the observation of gra gravitational waves, just just because I sent these emails out to in mass to these people that were willing to come on the show and do it remotely, it it was fantastic. That's awesome. Next question. Uh, Morgan Price in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada says, "What tricks do you use to get content stories out of experts who just want to talk facts?" We don't know anything about that here at Office Hours. <laughs> Go ahead, John. <laughs> So I did this to Courtney, I did it to Jason, I do it to everybody, is I go and I research their backgrounds and find out all about them. And, and then I have them talk about themselves, have them talk, have people talk about themselves. They love people like to talk about themselves. And then I always ask them, what do they do for fun outside of work? That's a good one, Bill. Yeah, we could spend hours and hours talking about how to interview other people to first, uh, get them settled, make them comfortable, and then have them come alive, which is really the process. I mean, you know, everyone is pretty passionate about something in their lives. Now, hopefully it's the subject that you are interviewing them about. Right. and It's not something else. But if they are, your job as an interviewer is primarily to make their eyes come alive when they're talking about it. Because if you can get them 
into that zone. And there's there's bunches of little tricks. I mean, the, the really good interviewers who do this, you know, over and over and over again, some of them are geniuses at getting that. Barbara Walters was always a genius at, at getting an emotional connection into her interviews. There are other people like Larry King who just know the structure and, and are so facile with the structure and have such good researchers that they just have a pace that they can keep and they know that pace and they're brilliant at driving it along. There's not one way to do this. There are a lot of ways to do this, but you do have to study it and you do have to do it and you have to become an interviewer, which I don't think is a trivial thing to become. Yeah, great that you so did that really well, Bill, is like succinctly. It's, it's essentially interviewing them and finding out... Um, that's what helps with if you are recording this, possibly talking to them in advance to find those find those buttons so that when you actually get to the interview, you can kind of get through some of that the fluff part first the get through what they actually want to talk about because they do they automatically default to statistics. But then when you're able to get them to say something and it's the beauty of it is called like the follow up question. So when they say something that is you see their eye light up a bit then, you know, take it and run for it. But as John said, that research is is everything. Next question. Oh, sorry, Noah? No worries. Yeah, I, I think it's almost like we are drawn to the meat of it, right? The facts, and I, I'm the same way, and uh, for better or for worse, right? Uh, where I, I love the, the meat of the story, and I, I want to get to the core of what we're trying to talk about. But the reality is people remember story more than, they remember the meat sometimes. Um, and so when you integrate those two together, you know, it's kind of like when you, uh, if you have an animal or a dog or, and you need to give them medicine, usually you mix it up with their food, right? <laughs> so I think it's the kind of the same thing is like the food is uh, the story and the pill is that meat, you know, the thing, the pill, the uh, medicine that we need to give the animal. And so I think we need both. Next question. Uh, Morgan Price, Victoria, B.C., says, what tricks do you use to get content stories out of experts who just want to talk facts? Isn't that pretty close? Yeah, to we, we just, just yeah, we just did that one. Uh, OK, uh, then it looks like Noah Sargent in Fullerton is up next again. This time he says, how would you manage designing content around a new local access channel focused on small business and creating positivity for the city sponsoring the channel? Go ahead, Courtney. What I would do is uh, look for a business association for that neighborhood. Like near me, there's this the Larchmont area. I used to have a a um, an office on there, and they have their Larchmont Business Association, and it's just association of all the businesses in that community. And you could start there and contact local businesses and see if they want to come on your show to promote their business or talk about their business and create a sense of community. And when you create a sense of community, it uh, gives people, uh, it's a lot more inclusive. It includes a lot of people and it gives people a way to explore their community that they may not have been able to explore before. So uh, contact a business association or your local chamber of commerce in the particular city that you're dealing with and uh, start there and get a list of businesses and contact them and see if they want to come on your show and talk about their business. Good points there. John? I thought it and it came out Courtney's mouth. How, how did that work? I don't know. There's a ton of these business mixer clubs. No, I, I used to go to all these when I was starting young like you and I started my business. And I had to go meet all these people at all these business mixers all the time. There's some nuggets in there, and, and those people would be happy to talk to you. And Bill, I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with that, but I'm gonna put a little caveat on it. I don't want the business organization to to suggest to me who it is that I want to go through to access their people. I want to figure that out for myself, and here's why I'm saying that. Uh, you can get somebody who's great as the operating officer of the Chamber of Commerce, but they just don't come across well on video. And if they say you're going to be talking with Jim and Jim is the guy who does this and Jim is horrible <laughs> on camera, uh, I don't want Jim. I want to try to find somebody else in the organization. So I would actually go to a few of the meetings and do an analysis of who who pops, who could be a good, you know, maybe it's the secretary sitting at the front desk who is brilliant and hidden back there. And she would be a much better public face of this thing. My whole point is to make this 
attractive for eyeballs. And so it's not personal attractiveness. It's just those people who who can command attention when you're watching them. And, you know, I've some hugely, hugely intellectually gifted people just are terrible on camera. And exactly the opposite, too. So I'm going to take some care with who the front person is, and I'm going to try to not just let the organization determine who that should be. Some great ideas. Yes, some great ideas put out there. And to follow up with um, Bill, essentially, this is where you will have an opportunity to do some discovery and to do some startup world lingo is like your tech lingo, you know, user user interviews. So actually going out. And so while the the business associations and those chambers and actually asking some questions, if you have that kind of um, time, even if you give yourself like a week to just do some research of what is out there, maybe there are some other access networks that are currently doing some shows and seeing what, you know, what you like about those shows, what you don't. And then if the, the the network already has like a mailing list, if there's a way to maybe do some some survey questions, uh, you know, if they haven't been active, that might be a little bit challenging to get people to respond. But a good old gift card or maybe a new, you know, gadget or tool uh, might be helpful. But just finding out, like asking, it's just like business, asking the customers what they need could go a really long way for then now your team being the creative side, the creative brain um, to make their needs like so you essentially this the information that you gather is like what do they want so you're solving the problem and then your team can put the creative spin um, around that so that could be something that would help as you're you're planning out the content and I'm thinking about when I say when I hear you say content it's not just like the creative part of the show but the actual what else will go with the programming Bill? Yeah, it's just thinking that next step over. If I was trying to, let's say we had a group of accountants or a group, you know, your local Better Business Bureau or whatever, and I was going to a meeting to find out, one of the things I might ask the person in the chair next to me is out of the last year's presentations here in the group, who who did the most memorable one for right. you? Right, yeah. And, you know, that alone is going to, you know, John did five, but John's were all dull as heck. <laughs> but Carlos, really, everybody just raved about it after his well i'm talking to carlos next not john sorry that's <laughs> just that's my job yeah so th- just some good ways to just get started next question ranjan chandil in los angeles said should part of content planning be saving a drafts or ideas section so that you can easily create new content on any platform go ahead john not sure what you mean by platform but i'll tell you what we do when we plan shows there's three hosts on nerd world and we have a Google Doc, and then we start putting all the ideas generally in a form of a question. And then we have a pool of like 30 questions prior to a show based upon the research of, of Googling the, the guest. And then that's curated down to like 10 main points that we use. And, that, and, and then I use that during the show as the rundown. It works out great. And Noah? That's excellent. Yeah, I always think of like starting wide and coming more narrow, right, as your approach. And so similar to what John just explained, I I have an idea uh, board in my Notion doc, which is the organizational tool I use. um, And I literally have 100 plus ideas of uh, content that I want to do. What's interesting is like when I first put an idea down, oftentimes I'll, I'll think it's super interesting and super important. And then a couple of weeks later, I'll come back and be like, eh, I don't really care about that so much anymore. Or one of my like lower ideas is now like super relevant to me or, or to my audience or what have you. So, um, yeah, just be prepared to um, iterate on that and then reprioritize um, as as you actually go through. And no idea is a bad idea when you're throwing it on the board. It doesn't mean you're going to use it, though. Yeah, I would echo what uh, Noah shared. And yes, definitely. Because when the idea of planning is to also help you to get ahead and to also help you that if at any point in time you need to like quickly address some other pressing news item or something that's relevant, that you can move things around. You're not struggling to like, when are we going to post this or when are we going to share that? So definitely encouraging like having things in in draft mode. I'm going to see if I can switch which, oh, no, wrong one.
one. Sorry, y'all. So like this is a tool while this is social media wise, like this is Planoly. And this on this side here is just placeholders for where we can at any point in time dump content in. And on this side, and this one is uh, specifically around um, from around Instagram, but we've got, you know, posts that are just sitting there with photos already. And all we'll need to do is actually like move them over. So just that planning of, because sometimes you'll have a day when you are like in the zone and you're pumping out, you've got all these ideas and pumping out all of that content, like go ahead and use that energy and b going back to like having systems in place, using those days when you batch your content and just have it there waiting for when you actually need it will just really help with your um, your workflow. Oh, one other tool that I did want to share. Some folks um, will use things like Noah mentioned Notion. So that's a tool. Um, folks will use Trello boards. And this is this is Asana, but just being able to have like, OK, uh, a vertical where you have like this is just all your ideas that you'll dump. But once you've actually like figured out, you know, said topic, whatever that topic is, you can start moving them around because like that topic works really well for blogs and you can actually like go into it. And if it's someone else on your team that you're working with that you can, you know, assign due dates and whatnot, and you can actually put notes in there and or tasks and or linking out to, you know, other documents. So those kind of tools will definitely help when you have to like, get those ideas out of your head and then you can like shift them around according to however it'll work for you planning wise. Bill? I just also wanted to make a quick note on the dangers of isolation when you're doing this. John mentioned he's got three people that work on it with him and they all toss things into a Google Doc and they all can. I, th I think that is so much stronger than trying to do all of this yourself. I had a circumstance decades ago where I got invited to come on a focus group for a corporation that was trying to change. And the person who was uh, facilitating this called me the night ahead and said, said, Bill, would you do me a favor? Would you throw some bombs in this meeting? These people are so hidebound in their thinking, they just will not come out of anything. So right. if you have any sparky ideas, even if they're outside and even if they're a little radical, toss them into this. I need to shake this up. We are not going anywhere. We're just having a circular discussion. So Outside and, and fr from that experience, I have started with my work trying to not just give it to my wife and four other people I know, but see if I can find new people or somebody who has a different perspective. If I'm uh, if I'm thinking this is great, let me find somebody who thinks this is terrible and entertain their ideas and see if they can actually poke a hole because I wasn't looking for that hole. So just another thought. Yeah, great points there. Next question. Ranjan Chandil in Los Angeles says, studios and production companies in film and TV use development teams to create content. What would be the equivalent for office hours to do consistent content? Go ahead, Noah. This is an excellent question, something I've thought about a lot. Um, I will preface my answer, though, with this is ultimately up to Alex <laughs> and what he wants to decide to do. Uh, but for me, I would love to see some sort of, some sort of formalization of like how we come up with an idea and, and what process it takes and how we recruit producers and get that in, into the next stage. Uh, for me, in college, we had what's called the training ground, where we had um, people submit an idea for a pilot episode, um, and then we whittled that down and decided to pick, you know, a handful of those to be produced, and they, they would shoot an, one episode or a pilot of that show, um, and then after that, that would get greenlit right for the next thing. Uh, Hollywood has a very similar structure. Um, the, there's a little bit more cutthroat, and they have a lot more ideas, but um, yeah, really within our group, um, the idea is part of it, but really... The execution is another huge part of it. You need um, a team and a leader to, to kind of push an idea through uh, the system. And so that, that's kind of what we're set up to do right now is somebody with a strong idea and a strong passion will help drive that through. But hopefully over time, just like with the ideas we talked about in the last question, hopefully we'll have a surplus of these ideas where we have more than what we can actually do. Um, and that's actually a good thing because it, it'll allow us to focus on what is the cream of the crop and the, the top priority ideas. And Courtney. Yeah, Hollywood is very competitive. And so uh, and, and coming up with ideas, they tend to be very, very secretive. They want to limit the number of people who know about a project because they don't want somebody to come in and scoop the project and produce that, uh, that uh, Emmy winning or Oscar winning film before they get a chance to get it through development. So uh, uh, 
that's kind of a different model than than something we're talking about with podcasting. Um, I think uh, for office hours, what we do is use Discord, and we have a second hours, uh, a second hour ideas uh, section in Discord where people are free to throw in their ideas for a good second hour and flesh them out there. And then Alex, I guess, chooses uh, which ones we're going to use if depending upon the amount of interest there is in each of those ideas. So we use Discord, which is a place for uh, all of us here on office hours are members of and can uh, post our ideas and see if and run things up the flagpole and see if anybody else salutes, you know. Yeah, and I think that part of helping for the the consistency wise is as has shared is like Alex has mentioned uh, some time over of just still you know making tweaks here and there and once we get to that point where we have you know possible leads like we do have folks that are leading you know the production the back end of things where there is um, more people helping with even the idea ideation um, he's mentioned things like research those types of things because of how how intensive it is to produce, you know, each show and even things happening in after hours that as it gets refined, that consistency comes from having having the system in place and having others to be able to shoulder it. Like Bill said in the last one, just even brainstorming with just one, you know, one person in a silo, but having a number of people in place who can help with certain verticals will definitely help with the consistency of the content. Next question. Noah Sargent, Fullerton up next with how do you prioritize content plan planning for a small business? Prioritization is the challenge, the the bane of the small, small business existence. But uh, really simply, just depending on the the project and or client wise. And Noah, feel free to jump in because are you saying like the for a small business that needs to do their content? Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Yeah. And, and kind of like advertising for um, your business, essentially, like because you only have so much time and um, I do have a plethora of ideas of what could be produced. It's just a matter of um, what makes the most sense. And obviously, the default answer for me is what brings the most value to the audience. Right. Um, but I'm trying to hope for a little bit more refinement on that. OK, so I thought you were about to say the same thing. I was like, what brings, yes, the most value, but also what brings the check through the door? Because, you know, as as creatives as well, we do we have all these. Oh, we could, you know, do this weekly or monthly or you know, all these wonderful ideas that will show the our capabilities. But at the end of the day, it is your bandwidth and your resources. So if it is a matter of, is it white papers, like picking one thing that you can see a return on investment and focusing on that, you know, focusing on that, that one thing, because for some people, I know this is a content planning show, but it might not even be content planning. It might be getting on the phones and by getting on the phones, you're bringing more dollars through the door so that now you can hire someone who can then work on your blog, someone who can then maybe splice up some work that you've done and put some of that content out on social media. So the prioritization, and, and this is not just me, also some mentors have, have shared that is, you know, looking at your cash flow first so that then you can then get the, the help that you need there. And if you are still at a point where cash flow is decent, but it's still a time and a bandwidth, um, picking one or two things that you can do well and consistently. So those are one of the um, the advice that I've been given and still trying to <laughs> implement as well. Bill, all of that content creation is a hard a curation is a hard thing. It's it's you know you're going to get tossed a lot of ideas as you prove that you can do shows and you put them out and they are they look good and they are successful to the extent that they are. People will start coming to you and saying, "Can you do my show? And can you do this show? And can you do that show?" The tough part is curating through those. I will say that it was a huge boost in my thinking when I had a client, a potentially very good client, come to me that I just totally did not want to work for. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned, I think it before, it was a meatpacking company that has more than one ar around the country. They had lots of budget and the rest of that. But I suddenly... <laughs> 
<laughs> was dreaming one day. I said, do I really want to be looking at slaughterhouse videos all day long? Is that how I want, you know, am I okay with that? I, I don't have a problem with their product. I consume their product, but is that what I want to steep myself in? And I said, no, and um, didn't have to fire the client because it was just a, an initial look, but I declined going that direction, even though it would have been lucrative. And so pushing that out into the big thing, you know, this is the time when you're young and starting out at this where you can decide what your standards are and what you want to go toward. If you are good at what you do and if you get more and more success, you will be doing more and more of whatever it is you're going to go out and start doing. So if you don't like the water and you hate it, you know, swimming lesson videos are probably not going to resonate with you forever. Right. And that's just a metaphor for any subject that you don't think, if this became the central core of my life, would this satisfy me? Or am I only doing it for the money? And and I, I, I'm not turning my nose down at only doing it for the money. But I'm saying if I'd had those circumstances where I was doing it for the money because I needed to keep my business afloat, I would put a time limit on it. I will do this for you know two years and that's it. And I'm right. going to work like a dog to get out of this area of business and into something that I do have more passion for because I know me and I know I'm going to put a lot of time into this and I want to be around things that bring richness to my life as well. Right. Noah? Yeah, Bill definitely hit the nail on the head there. I think when even for the most recent shows that we did with uh, Nam and Cinegear, um, I went ahead and filled the role that was needed, right? I was boots on the ground and I helped um, shoot and put together a kit, um, which was great except that's not what I want to continue doing. Like, I don't want to be a shooter, even though I'm competent. I have those skills. Um, I'm moving towards being a producer and the big picture guy. Um, and so what was funny to me is like right after I had uh, folks hitting me up for the next project as a shooter, I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, that's not what I want to do. I'm, I'm wanting to focus on the big picture stuff. And I did it because I had to and I had to get the job done, right? But it's not something that I um, am necessarily passionate about or want to continue doing because I've done it for 15 years now, so. Right. And just uh, to add on to what you just shared there, this is where the uh, behind your question is prioritizing your content planning, because that's the direction. And this ties in a little with branding that you want to go. That's the kind of content you want to put out there is the content that shows your skills, your capabilities around your producing. So if it is, if really quickly of just like, is it a, a blog or a video, you know, 60 second nuggets or whatever around producing because you're not who you say you are, it's what people say you are. So people are saying that you're a shooter and you want to tell them and demonstrate that you're a producer. So that would be a great way because going back to you said this is, that's what makes your heart leap. That's what makes you excited, putting out that kind of content to help change the narrative and help drive those, you know, those dollars in would be a, a good way of prioritizing that because that is going to impact your, your bottom line. Next question. Noah Sargent Fullerton, what content elements do you often see missing from creative creators? Go ahead, Courtney. You know what I like? Uh, I like to see something, if I'm watching a YouTube video uh, that's, you know, uh, analyzing a product or a new service or, uh, you know, doing side-by-side -side comparisons of uh, new items, I like to see it structured like a book. I like to see a table of contents. And when I see like um, Curtis Judd does an analysis of uh, audio video products, great channel. And a great thing that he does at the beginning, he'll have a summary right at the, right at the very beginning before he starts doing all of his analysis that shows the pros and the cons of the item that he's going to be talking about. So, you know, right offhand, uh, are there a lot of good things? Or are there a lot of bad things about this? For the, so you know whether you want to continue onto that video and and see how he came to those conclusions. So it gives you kind of a a uh, a look into what's ahead. Also, a lot of uh, a lot of people uh, construct a uh, kind of like a table of contents or an index right at the beginning. Uh, so if they're going to be 
you know, testing out a synthesizer, for example, they'll have different sections where, okay, we're going to look at the oscillators, then we're going to look at the, you know, voltage control filters, then we're going to look at this and this, and they'll show times at the beginning of that hit index. So that if you are only interested in a certain aspect of that product, you can jump to that time and see what they thought and see the demonstration of that product. So it serves as a useful index. And that's something I miss from a lot of content. Uh, I like to be able to know what's coming or uh, it also optimizes, you know, does search engine optimization because those things that are in those printed uh, indexes are listed as uh, are put into the uh, metadata for that particular video right. and allows it to be searched on a specific item or a specific analysis of a specific function of a specific item. And, and you don't get that kind of granularity usually if it's just, you know, an unboxing and, oh, look what we discovered, you know, hey, it does this. Uh, it's much more uh, constructed and they construct that menu after the fact, after they've after the video has been edited uh, so that they can put those links into the different time timeline. Right. Bill, real quick. Just not avoiding the formula. I'm so tired of seeing every interview with er, and everybody on YouTube's. And now like and subscribe and let me tell you how good I am at this and blah, blah, blah. And you're a minute and a half into things before it starts. And I, I'm raising my hands because I'm totally guilty of the same thing. Over explaining, over babbling before I get to the point. Next question. Ranjan Chandil of Los Angeles. What books or websites do you read to give you inspiration in creating content? Go ahead, John. You know, one tip that I that I've learned over the years is find somebody that has what you want and go go listen and figure out what they did to get there. And so one of the great sites for YouTube is Social Blade. And type in Social Blade, then you type in your channel and you'll get all of the statistics related to that person, how much money, how much um, you know, everything related to the content. On the free bird, they have a premium version too, but uh, it's a really good tool to go research people that are being very, very successful. Like Mr. Beast is, according to Social Blade, is earning anywhere between 100 to 1.5 million a month on off of his YouTube channel. And Bill? I don't read anything that's not fiction outside of this. I, and it's just funny for me. I don't really care about structural stuff. I, I think the structural stuff is well known and it's the same structural stuff that's been there, you know, three act plays or whatever it is, all that structural stuff I learned when I was in my first year. Now I want ideas and to understand what reaches hearts, not what structures systems. I, it's important and I'm not dismissing it and you have to know what AWS is and all the rest of that. But the content itself is going to be, as John was saying, a lot of the people saying the story. So I like to read stories and I like to see how good authors capture my heart. Yeah. And I will add that tools like Pinterest, just I know for me, just if I just need my brain to woosah and breathe that I will use the keywords and kind of see what images and what's out there. And that's just for creative inspiration um, with the content and understanding maybe what's next or thinking through that. Social Media Examiner is a, a pretty good one because they stay on top of um, news wise. And that way I can just make sure that we're plugged in with next steps and and um, making sure that we are in line with what's what's happening out there and what works well for our clients. Next question. Guy Cochran in Seattle says, what content planning advice does the Office Hours community have to help lift conversations with Tony Mobley? Bill? I, 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 you've done an amazing job, Tony, if you're listening today, of doing this. Um, but you've now, I think, got to transfer to the next thing, which is, You've talked mostly about people who you have a relationship of some kind with, whether it's the office hours team or people through your church or whatever. If you want to sustain this for a, a substantially longer time, you've got to do the, one of the toughest things in the world, which is the cold call. It's, it's reaching out past your comfort zone and finding out how to read an article and find out, oh, that person is interesting and how to reach through and get to that person or their representatives or whomever and make your case that they should come on your show. It is very difficult as a lift, but I don't think in the long run you can do five years of shows unless you can get out of 
that part of your comfort zone and figure out the skills necessary to reach a stranger and, ha- and motivate them to come onto your show. And I think you can do it. Yeah, so I, plus a thousand on great job thus far, you know, a year plus in to it to um, Bill's point is the PR, the PR, the social media part of it, because you have a lot of great content. And this ties actually into the next question of just like now there's an opportunity to start chop some stuff down and put it out there from a social wise, going back to past guests, asking them, Hey, can, you know, tagging them, asking, being intentional, not all the time when you tag someone, they get so many tags or they're inundated with stuff. Go ahead and intentionally ask them to please reshare of a um, a friend who manages a community. And he literally at least once a week says, Hey everyone, this episode just came out, please go and share and, you know, activating your community. So you've got a lot of great content. It's now as to guy's point, the lift is the legwork behind distribution. So thinking about it as distribution, um, distribution, PR, and the art of the cold call. Next question. Rich Graham in Dallas, Texas says, how much emphasis should be put on repurposing content for various channels? Any do's and don'ts? Yes. Repurposing is your friend because people, uh, the statistic, it's probably changed by now, but it takes at least eight touches before someone actually, it actually clicks what they're seeing and or reading. So repurposing works really well. Um, The do's and don'ts don't just have one you know, make sure you know the aspect ratios or how that platform, how that content will perform there, um, making sure that your headlines, your images, the resolution of whatever that content piece might look like, using your keywords so that you are, you know, searchable and and get indexed on um, sites. But yeah, to, to go ahead and do it and then check your analytics when you repurpose and repurposing at different times of day as well, testing out days, um, all of those things into it. Because if you're just doing the same thing over and over, um, you your results might not be as accurate as you think they are. Next question. Guy Cochran in Seattle has our next question. Guy says, what software do you recommend for content planning? Go ahead, Noah. I really like Notion. I know a lot of people use Google Docs and the client that I'm just starting with um, likes monday.com. I mean, they're all great tools. It's just spending the time to learn them and organize them so that you can have a workflow for your content. That's a good one. Go ahead, Bill, real quick. For years, I used Omni Outliner, but I've moved away from that and I'm exploring a thing called Craft, which just won Apple Software of the Year last year. And uh, I'm I'm finding it really interesting to dive into. Next question. Douglas Carmichael said, for content that mixes entertainment and information like... Uh, mad in the kitchen how do you balance information with entertainment oh that's a good one this is where there's an opportunity for you to that you're testing so if you have a show that you put out there and it is heavy on the entertainment like in te- being just being intentional with a little bit more info here maybe a little bit more entertainment and then seeing how people respond to that would be one of my first recommendations always letting your audience test and let you know go ahead noah I think one of the great examples of this is Mythbusters. Um, It's one of my favorite informational but also entertaining type shows. And there's tons of examples out there. But like we said earlier, or like like I said earlier, I think you need both to really captivate the audience. Um, I I prefer a more meaty type approach. um, And then it's really going to depend on the individual and the audience member and how how much of uh, information they want versus entertainment. And Bill. Hard to do, uh, but I think entertainment generally trumps information in this respect. If the basic information is good, uh, I, I'm just remembering every college lecture I had that the professor was dull as anything, and it was a struggle to get the information out of it. On the other hand, a engaging presenter, even if the information is 100% there, it gets me so excited about it that I will fill in those gaps on my own. That's just my personal thing. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says, could the RFI, Room for Improvement Process, be used on a conceptual level with a test audience to approve your content almost in real time? Go ahead, Noah. So Hollywood uses test audiences and there's a cycle of this um, 
pattern that happens. And so basically what you're talking about is shortening that process of um, creating something, getting feedback and creating that feedback loop, right? And so that shorter process creates more iterations and creates a better product faster, right? And so um, the short answer is yes, hopefully we'll get to a real time scenario, but uh, there is gonna be some sort of lag between that process and being able to spit out the next generation of, of content. Go ahead, Courtney, real quick. You used to be able to do this in Hollywood, uh, but with social media now, uh, it becomes dangerous because, you know, you do a test screening and now it'll be all over social media as to whether that movie or whatever it is you're testing is good, bad or indifferent before you have even released it. So you have to be careful about that these days. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, when planning coverage of an event like Office Hours Space, where educational background material is essential to keep the audience engaged, what ratio should you aim for between the background material and the event? Noah? Probably around 20% for background um, because the event has so much going on as well. I mean, ultimately, you're, you're balancing those two uh, between the background material and what's going on. And so we used videos as a very power, powerful, uh, powerful tool uh, that Chris Finwick and the team worked on. And I think those came out across very well. And I thought they were very interesting uh, videos that gave us a break in the live show as well. And Bill. I'm not sure that it didn't all have both. And here's the reason I say that. You had a lot of data, but the data had been given to professionals, Tuomo and his generating of things and the layout and everybody on the team top to bottom. The data was as fascinating as it's visually clear and compelling as was what was being said on site. So I think it's a mix of both. You can make inter data entertaining and you can make uh, talking boring and you have to watch out for both. Well, there we have another, the end of another great second hour. Thank you so much to our producers for all of your questions, panelists for your insights and your input. And of course, our back end team for which this would not be possible looking as amazing as it is. Just a reminder that Ken Jordan will be in After Hours going over WordPress and websites. So you want to head over right now and to see what's happening for the rest of the week here on office hours visit officehours.global thank you so much and we will see you in after hours bye good job liberty thank you thank you i'm gonna have to go watch the after hours section because i've um you know i need to press some of my words because they're getting awfully wrinkled